Well, welcome everyone to the WTTC's virtual sessions. This strategic insight session will look at how we're aiming to rediscover travel after two years of pandemic-driven travel restrictions. We know in 2019, capital investment in travel and tourism amounted to 986 billion US dollars. Now that figure fell by nearly 30% in 2020 to 693 billion, the biggest drop ever. But we know that to unlock the sector's recovery and potential growth, investment will be key. As destinations try to attract sustainable investment, they will not only need to create an enabling business environment, but consider new opportunities surfacing as a result of shifting consumer and industry trends. Now, looking ahead, what are the most interesting sustainable investment opportunities within the travel and tourism for both destinations and the private sector? Well, that's among the questions we'll be asking our panel of experts next. Joining me now are Daryl Wade, the chairman of Intrepid Group, Pansy Ho, call chairperson and an executive director at MGM China Holdings Limited, and Liz Ortiguera, the CEO of the Pacific Asia Travel Association. Well, welcome to you all, and I'm sure we're going to have a great conversation. Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, capital investment in travel and tourism took a significant hit as a result of COVID-19. So really, my first question is, what should be prioritized as investment starts to return? Let's start with you, Liz. Sure. First of all, um, the first step is on training in terms of destination management and really understanding what are the needs for these destinations to reinforce the foundation of sustainability, which is resilience. Um, and so, you know, it, the needs of each destination are very specific. Um, and so it really is educating up at a national, a provincial and a local level. You know, what are the needs of that destination? Um, one thing that we do know is that travel and tourism contributes to about 5 to 8% of global human-driven carbon dioxide emissions, with transport being about 75% of that, um, and accommodations 20%, and the rest others. So decarbonized transport initiatives would be critical on top of those destination-specific needs. Thanks for that, Liz. Really interesting uh, figures there. And, and Daryl, would you tend to concur? Look, I would concur. Um, I think it's interesting um, in the context of Intrepid, we have um, uh, offices in about 35 countries around the world and we're seeing really different uh, trends in different markets, which I guess is not surprising coming out of a pandemic. But the one thing that we are seeing, which is common, is that this tendency towards domestic travel is really lingering perhaps a lot longer than we expected to. And people, even for the next 12 months, are booking domestic holidays rather than just hopping on back on a plane and doing the, the uh, transcontinental or intercontinental type journey. And that surprised us. And so we really starting to reallocate our investment decisions into that domestic context rather than traditional long haul destinations. Fascinating domestic tourism, of course, because people are fearful of perhaps traveling. All those travel restrictions during the pandemic didn't make it easy either. Now, yeah, uh, I think Hansi, is that something you tend to agree with as well? So, um, especially, especially in the case of China, um, it is uh, getting to be actually even more difficult to determine, for instance, for a traveler per se, to, to actually arrange even for the logistics. Many of the long haul flights uh, have not actually uh, all recovered. Um, we will need to see that uh, in the next cycle, uh, a lot of those uh, ca uh, capacities and capabilities will need time to resume. Um, and I think, um, in fact, during this period of time, uh, people are going to be um, feeling more confident about just doing more domestic or regional traveling. Uh, and that is what we are also exposed to. Okay, so a, a, a similar theme coming across there, domestic travel, regional travel, staying close to home. We now focus on the very important question of how travel and tourism investment can help the sector achieve sustainable growth targets. So, you know, it's really fascinating because, because I spoke to another group of travel experts who said that purpose-driven, sustainable travel is a big consumer trend. So how are shifting consumer trends like these impacting investment 
in travel and tourism. Daryl, why don't you start? Sure. Um, well, in, in, in a way, it's kind of an extension of that previous concept, in, in, I think. But um, we, we've seen for the last 10 to 15 years, really, a, a general trend towards more purpose-driven travel, more sustainable travel. Clients are demanding that more and more. And, and so we've been kind of at the lucky end of the industry in that sense that we, we continue to grow just because we're in the right place at the right time. Um, but, but certainly at a, at a more macro level, we're seeing, uh, I work uh, quite a bit with bookings these days, uh, bookings, and they are finding that sustainability is a key driver of choice. So people are, are travelling to, you know, be at Amsterdam or New York or Bangkok or wherever, and sustainability is a key factor in their decision making. Um, and that's increasingly gaining weight. So it's something that, again, will drive that decision-making process for um, hoteliers, destination managers, and so forth. And Liz, is that something that you're seeing uh, with your institutions? Absolutely. And I'd say even more so in Asia Pacific. So recently we worked with Economist Impact, and they did a survey of travellers in Asia Pacific that shows them more than seven in 10 respondents agree that COVID-19 has changed the way they think about sustainable tourism by making it more important to them. And the numbers are even more striking in some of the countries in our region. 98.5% of respondents in the Philippines, 96.5% in India, and 93.5% in Malaysia say that the pandemic has changed the way they think about sustainable tourism. Um, well over half, 57%, said that they think differently about tourism and how to do it sustainably, especially as it relates to the local economy, the communities, cultures, and the environment. And so this is a real call out to the destinations to tailor it to the emerging consumer needs. This is the silver lining that's coming out of the pandemic, which is great. It's great for the planet and it's great for the local communities. And um, this is an opportunity to make sure that you know, the travel that does return um, benefits more equitably and is um, restorative or reinforces the local culture, the local environment. Um, and so this is a great, you know, this is a great uh, positive outcome from a very challenging two years. Yeah, challenging two years indeed. And fascinating, as you say, it was those destinations, the Philippines, Malaysia, India, who are often uh, destinations for tourism themselves that uh, you know, voted so highly for sustainable tourism. So let's move on to the kinds of investments now needed to remain sustainable. So what kind of specific types of investments in travel and tourism will ensure that the sector really becomes more resilient and sustainable? Uh, Pansy, would you like to take this one? Sure. Um, I believe that um, in fact, I want to just echo a little bit to the last question as a uh, the background or backdrop, you know, towards the, the answering uh, to the investment direction. Um, so even in the case of where we are, like in Macau, for instance, per se, which is typically, you know, known to the rest of the world as the gaming kind of a uh, uh, and, and entertainment uh, sort of destination. And therefore, most people would automatically equate indoor experiences um, and activities to be, you know, predominantly uh, the main attraction. But through the COVID-19, you know, two and a half year, uh, bringing also a new form of uh, awakening to, to well-being, to understanding that, you know, uh, and, and people having more, time to also now uh, focus on uh, a balancing kind of lifestyle, taking on more sport uh, activities and wanting to go out in the open have actually driven our thoughts mm. around now in preparation for the regeneration and recovery um, to think out of the box. So even for you know, what we call gaming enterprises like us in the boardrooms, you'd be surprised to find out that every day when we are planning towards, you know, reopening, we are not talking about how to make, you know, the, 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 the kind of past activities more uh, attractive because it's not us who will drive the uh, tourism arrivals. It's the tourists themselves who will choose and pick when, you know, they can now travel the world where they want to go. So we even are propelled into thinking how we can compete with, you know, some of the other destinations. And also, of course, because China is, you know, one of the uh, preeminent leaders now in basically championing uh, its own climate goals, 
for basically, you know, full uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, elimination by 2030 and achieving uh, neut full neutrality by 2060. So we are following on that course. And, and you'll be surprised that we are now all talking about investing in areas and fields besides and outside of the previous norm. We want to build Macau to be also the very healthy and um, you know, very um, basically a, a destination that goes back to our roots, which is in fact the leisure and the recreational aspects. Uh, we have a lot of also the outdoors, uh, the, the, the trails and, and, and even the seaside activities that have been long gone and forgotten, you know, by most of the tourists. And now we all want to reactivate that. And that's the area of our investments. Well, that is so good to hear that even Macau, uh, as you say, a gaming capital is trying to make these strides. Uh, Daryl, I heard you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, no, I think uh, actually just going to echo what Pansy's just said. Um, you know, when it comes to investment decisions, we're really changing our profile as well in, in a similar way and that our clients are saying they want to be outside. Um, so we, we've just acquired a walking company in the United States, for instance, um, where putting a significant investment into cycling. And these were used to be fringe activities and now they're becoming mainstream activities. People want to get out there and be out in the environment. They also want to travel in a way that has a lower carbon footprint. And obviously, if you're on your feet or on a bike, it's doing just that. And so uh, it, it's really starting to change our thinking about where we're putting investment dollars now going forward. Yeah, and, and the focus seems to be on outdoor uh, activities and, and sport, which, of course, is a huge consumer trend as well. Liz, what are you seeing in terms of consumer trends? A very similar regarding this wellness focus. Um, you know, we're advocates for a holistic approach to wellness, which is not just about self, but it's self, community, environment, and integrating that into the product that you're offering. Um, we had Susie Ellis um, from Global Wellness Institute as a guest speaker in our well first uh, virtual wellness conference last quarter. And she commented that all travel is now wellness travel. And it may not be the primary um, uh, objective of your trip, but along your journey, um, you will make a number of wellness decisions from you know, what you eat, where you sleep, um, the activities you do, you know, even if you're on a business meeting, you know, how you take care of yourself on the road. And more and more, um, you know, the, those lines between corporate and leisure travel are really getting blurred. So it, it, you, we won't be able to um, define black and white, you know, um, it's really very integrated. And this has always been, you know, a part of uh, a travel in the past, but more so than ever now. And there are forms of travel that are emerging that, you know, the recovery will really look different. It's not, um, you know, people always ask me, when are we going back to normal? Well, travel is, it's not going back to the way it was, but people will take longer journeys. They'll integrate friends, family, business. You know, they'll go and um, virtual teams will connect for the first time, you know, in, in new forms of retreats. Um, and, you know, they'll gravitate to appealing, um, you know, more nature-based, less congested um, destinations. So there are a number of um, interesting movements that are happening in the industry. And it's important that, you know, we... Um, as an industry, respond to these rising consumer needs. Yeah, fascinating. As you say, the, the line between corporate and leisure travel is starting to blur. You know, this whole pleasure is a term I've been hearing lately that's so fascinating. It certainly is a big trend, isn't it? So, so now let's focus in specifically on the impact tourism has on the planet. I mean, what investments should the sector prioritize in the next few years specifically to reduce carbon emissions enough by 2030 and help reach the net zero goal for 2050. Seems a lofty ambition. Can it be done? Daryl, why don't you take this one? Sure. Um, well, WTDC has actually been um, very involved in this space over the last 12 months in particular in terms of framing up um, how we head to a, a net uh, zero world in, by 2050. But then more to the point, I think everyone's now realising that 2050 is a long way away, but arguably is also too far away and that we've got to make significant inroads by 2030. Um, and so in the context of that, the WTDC signed as a, a supporting body the uh, Glasgow Declaration on Tourism um, in November last year, COP26, 
um, that has a framework to guide um, member companies and, and, and others through on that journey to uh, significant reductions of carbon emissions by 2030 and then complete reductions by 2050. So, you know, I think decarbonisation is, you know, by far the biggest story uh, that our industry has to face. Um, and, you know, we, ha- I've been saying for a while, there's a level of risk for our industry as well if we don't get this right. Um, in the years ahead, uh, the percentage of carbon emissions in the world from travel and tourism will actually increase because uh, we've got various hard to abate sectors, such as shipping and aviation. Some are easier, such as accommodation and, and hospitality, um, but we've certainly got a problem. So we do have to work that much harder to get the early wins on the table. Yeah. And, and Pansy, is this something that you're seeing in terms of the, the regions you cover? Indeed. Well, we are situated in what we now call the Greater Bay Area, which, you know, includes the two special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau, uh, together with nine cities in the Guangdong province. And in the neighborhood, you know, within this um, basically metropolitan, we're talking about um, Shenzhen, uh, that is, in fact, in close proximity, which obviously uh, is the kind of technology hub today for uh, the Greater Bay Area. Uh, We have also a lot of um, academic um, uh, kind of efforts going through a lot of the universities in Hong Kong. So in the future, the objective is to pull together all these resources and work, you know, uh, as one big kind of uh, party to help each other resolving some of the problems. So for instance, in Macau, of course, we are mostly a tourism kind of a destination economy and, and uh, 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 kind of uh, urban development, um, we, we will not be able to completely rely on our own uh, capabilities. So now we are tapping into these uh, uh, kind of resources for help. So um, in fact, we have taken lead uh, in, in that respect. MGM, uh, which is, you know, my company has taken the lead to establish uh, the low carbon green development alliance in Macau with other hotels and industry partners uh, and professional alliances. And then we are the first, in fact, to build a fully compliant, uh, you know, a low carbon kind of uh, a hotel building, which we have been awarded uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, awards and uh, recognition uh, from China and, and elsewhere. So we, we are deliberate in terms of making sure that we will be the uh, the, the person driving these forces. Um, and we are the first also to commit fully switching, for instance, to electric, full electric shuttle buses, you know, by 2023, and also to implement uh, innovative food waste management strategies. And we target to have 100% of all our food waste diversion uh, by 2030. So we need to be, as the, as the kind of important local enterprises. We need to step ahead and we need to also, you know, be the ones who are bringing together some of these solutions. Um, and, and now we can tap into, you know, a vast kind of uh, pool of resources, talents, uh, technology, um, and utilize Macau. Actually, it's a two-way thing. We, because we have 30 some million visitors a year in a very small place of only, you know, 30 some square kilometers, we would be the best case study in a way. So this sort of establishing a, 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 a way of having the technology, people come to us and utilizing us as, in fact, a good platform, you know, to really come together with good solutions, I think would be the way, you know, to set forth, you know, for, for our, our region. Yeah, really fascinating. You're right. I mean, Macau is tiny, but it acts as a great microcosm uh, uh, to set as a context to scale up some of those technologies for other places as well. Now, now Liz, this is something I know that PATA has been looking at for a number of years in terms of the kind of sustainable investments required. Uh, tell us what you found. Um, well, first of all, we did, as a foundation, um, we launched recently a, a destination resilience program. And this is a training program for governments at a national, provincial, and a city level. And it's really to assess, you know, what are their needs? Because resiliency is really the foundation to sustainability. And so every destination will require different investments to enable it to reduce carbon emissions to eventually reach its net zero goals. 
Um, but that national strategy and that audit is critical um, for specific destinations. And as I mentioned earlier, decarbonization solutions for transportation is key. Um, so develop one, developing sustainable aviation fuels and scaling up low or no carbon ground and water transport options is key, as well as to uh, helping accommodation facilities to retrofit with energy and water saving equipment and technologies. In addition to that, there's a need for regulatory incentives, concessional financing and tax relief that can help ex accelerate the transition and make it affordable um, so that uh, the, tr the transition can be made in our various destinations. Yeah, you definitely need the carrot uh, to entice a lot of these organizations, don't you, in terms of mm -hmm. tax relief uh, when they become uh, much more green friendly. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of investors who are now looking for sustainable investments, what really should they be looking for in an organization or a destination? Um, Daryl, perhaps you've got some insight in terms of the destinations that, that your firm represents. Look, I think um, just going back a little bit, investors increasingly had a, a set of uh, ESG criteria that they need to fulfil. And so where they're sourcing their money from, um, they need to be able to prove to their own investors um, that they're o uh, operating and investing in accordance with e good ESG guidelines. So that in turn is starting to dictate where money can flow through to. And so I think um, in terms of, destinations and, and products such as hotels or cruising or, or whatever it is, um, increasingly companies are going to need to prove their ESG criteria. So that might be the decarbonisation, uh, it might be human rights policies, it might be plastic policies. You know, there's a whole suite of uh, ESG criteria which will drop into the decision-making process. So um, there's a long way to go and some countries are well ahead, some countries are, are not. And uh, and, and obviously, as you go down, the large uh, players, particularly the big hotel chains, very aware of these issues. Some of the smaller independents and, and destinations are perhaps not up to speed yet. And so I think as an industry, we've got a real responsibility to, to talk, as we are today, uh, about these issues to, to get um, the, the different players up to speed as quickly as possible, because it's, uh, it's not going away. Uh, it's, it's going to become more and more important in terms of uh, getting right, the right funds into the right place to get adequate returns with risk profiles being measured properly. Yeah, crucial, isn't it, to educate uh, some of those uh, smaller companies that perhaps aren't so aware. Uh, Liz, is this something that you're seeing as well? Um, I'd say yes, but actually it needs to come from the top, you know, I would say for investors looking to do sustainable investments, look for the destinations that really publicly commit to it um, and, and outline a strategy. You know, so we're, we're proud and happy to be working with, for example, Rasa Kaima, who's committed to being the most sustainable destination among the Emirates, you know, over the next 10 years. And then also, you know, Singapore has come out with a, a very strong strategy around wanting to be a sustainable destination too. And you know, everyone, they acknowledge they're not there today, but what's, what's important is that they're committed to it. Um, and you know, having that um, leading from the top and then having a public-private strategy so that both sides of the industry are engaged is really critical. And, you know, and I would echo that comment around ensuring that it filters down to the backbone of the travel and tourism industry, which is the uh, small operators and um, at the grassroots level. So it really needs to be an integrated approach that's led from the top. Yeah, fascinating. And you know, interesting, you've mentioned that pu public-private partnership is crucial uh, as well. Uh, Pansy, is that something that you're seeing with MGM and, uh, uh, and governments? Indeed. Um, in fact, um, at uh, MGM, which we also at the same time, a public listed company on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And I mean, in the past few years, the uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange actually has made uh, the ESG goals um, and the corporate sustainability kind of benchmark index to be also a key kind of uh, 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 a basis for evaluating uh, the, the kind of uh, qualification of uh, these, the, the listed companies. And so, you know, already in, the, in its 11th consecutive year, uh, one of our own companies beyond just MGM also has been named as a, a constituent stock of the Hang Seng 
Corporate Sustainability Benchmark Index. So today, more and more uh, investors and people will look toward you know, uh, these sort of uh, indexes to determine whether, in fact, there is the full commitment, uh, both in terms of the financial investment as well as its you know, appreciation and understanding and ability to also invest, incentivize even their own staff members to follow through and to also track you know, the, the kind of performance of a company based on your uh, efforts in uh, ESG uh, kind of uh, management. So these are all, in fact, uh, I think very important uh, level of uh, 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 kind of ways to educate, not just the, uh, the, the people who are uh, in the corporate offices, but also obviously triggering down to even the operating levels. Um, and, and if we can, be the, the people in the, from the private side also you know, performing to that sort of a standard, I believe that therefore it will also help the destination, even you know, now going back to the governments for them to also you know, have the full uh, kind of appreciation and therefore uh, to commensurate uh, also with their own policies in terms of supporting you know, how the corporates can actually develop and you know, uh, their investment policy uh, strategies in, in these destinations. Fascinating. Daryl, I heard you sort of concurring there. Is there anything <laughs> yeah. else you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, look, I, I think Penz is really right in that uh, one of the kind of revelations we've had over the last few years, though, is that uh, there's real shared value in this concept around uh, ESG and, and purpose, you know, in that as investors, uh, we can get great outcomes. So that's terrific. But interestingly enough, it's the customers who are also getting the benefit of the products you're creating, your staff, if you in, really engage through good ESG practices and, and uh, talk to your staff about that, engage them in the process, their sense of belonging in the company also lifts up and their um, enjoyment of the, the work experience lifts up and that's measurable. Um, and so it's just a virtuous cycle, in fact, if we get this the right way and have the conversations with all different stakeholders to, to really get great outcomes. But uh, I was going to move on to... Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the strides that uh, companies, the industry in general, governments, the private sector, et cetera, are all making to try to achieve sustainability. But uh, which regions and industries lack signif significant investment? I mean, which areas really need to improve uh, to try to drive the kind of investments needed? And Liz, would you like to pick up on this one first? Sure. Um most destinations are traditionally focused on mass tourism experiences, and, and that's brought them scale and volume and visitors. Um, but, but now we need serious investment to improve and enhance these experiences to, to less travel destinations. So I'm seeing that across the region. Um, to, you know, there's more investment and promotion being done to secondary and tertiary destinations, which is great. Um, it'll um, spread the wealth and the and the, uh, the development. And the important thing is to do it in a really um, sustainable, mindful way um, so that we don't, you know, we avoid uh, the over tourism that we've seen in, in the past and we get that dispersion and we get that economic uplift at the same time, preserving the natural environment and the culture. And so I think that, you know, the education and the investment into you know, the less trodden, um, the, you know, the lesser known destinations is really, it's happening and it's critical that that continues right now. Um, and the other aspect too would be ensuring that, that the local communities get engaged in designing those products um, mm. because that's, that's good for the local community as well as um, what we found is in creative tourism, when you design it right and it's interactive and it's engaging, the, the visitors, um, have a stronger affinity for your destination and they'll post more, they'll, um, they'll, they'll respect and appreciate the culture more and they'll talk about it. Yeah, that's a really fascinating idea. Getting the local community involved is, is crucial, something we hope to talk about a little bit more as well. But, but Daryl, in terms of areas of improvement, where would you suggest? Um, so from an investment perspective, I'm not quite sure, but, but it is investment invariably follows actual customers. It's not the other way around. And so what we are seeing is that there's very substantial uh, trends in the data that customers are wanting to go to uh, less touristed areas in secondary cities, provincial towns and regions and so forth. And whether that's a kind of a post-COVID 
uh, trend or whether it's a fundamental shift in what people are looking for, we're still not 100% sure. But there's unquestionably a trend to, to, to go more remote. Now, that's a really good thing in terms of spreading the economic benefits of tourism. And so, you know, as tourism planners, we might almost like to have that outcome, but in fact, it's happening from uh, the marketplace, not, not from the industry. And so, you know, it's up to us to, to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pansy, I mean, MGM is such a, a huge company covering so many different areas. Uh, where do you see uh, the requirements for more investments to try to improve the situation? Um, I believe, you know, following on to, you know, my other panelists' um, direction, and, and, and I agree entirely, which is, like I said earlier, even for Macau, even for MGM here, um, the objective is no longer just to bring customers through our own doors and be kept there, uh, which was previously maybe a kind of misconception about how a casino operates. Um, we now actually want to be more integrated with you know, the rest of the city. We want to become the place of choice for people to actually come and enjoy uh, our offerings. But at the same time, this should be not the final destination. This should be, in fact, maybe because of our uh, uh, attraction and, and all the different forms of entertainment we provide, this should be a good impetus for uh, uh, travelers to decide to come to Macau. But once they are here, we also do want them to actually you know, um, explore other aspects of Macau. And as well now, as I said earlier, triggering into the other parts of the Greater Bay Area. I mean, we now are talking about a much bigger uh, footprint. And therefore, you don't have to travel five times to the same area. You know, China is so huge. You cannot afford, in fact, as I said, uh, almost always, that even for me, maybe throughout my, the rest of my life, I can't potentially be, you know, covering all parts of China, you know, uh, and I need to go even once a year, I could only go to one province, you know, each time. But so try to fix an itinerary, uh, especially for regional travelers, you know, uh, not so many trips over, but then each trip to make full use of your time here and explore more. Uh, and, and therefore, in that respect, we are, again, cutting down, you know, a lot of the maybe, you know, uh, uh, traveling emissions through all the flights. And instead, we organize a lot more now on other means. We have now developed more of the uh, kind of uh, 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 travel connectivity through uh, light emission type of uh, vehicles and uh, other forms of uh, traveling arrangements that could basically also contribute towards, you know, uh, the, the so-called um, uh, environmental kind of context. And, um, and I think people will actually have longer kind of uh, experiences and also, you know, memories of these very good examples. And, mm -hmm. and, and now with the technology, as long as they are going to help promote it, you know, we are then going to be able to have more travelers who will actually want to come uh, and, and therefore we can disperse again, you know, uh, the, the way how people all jam to come in, at the same time, you know, always just, you know, maybe over a course of the, the, the so-called peak season of the two months. So in that way, I think that would be, you know, potentially the way, you know, to organize ourselves and, and to work with our, our, our stakeholders and partners. Yeah, so, so what you're saying is areas for improvement in terms of under-touristed areas, uh, having more visitors, spreading up the, uh, the over-tourism you're seeing in certain areas. Now, mm -hmm. let's move on, because what I've been hearing is, you know, how important it is to, to green the sector, the, the kind of light uh, vehicle, you know, uh, vehicles you've just mentioned, Pansy, the, uh, the uh, emissions issues, um, you know, becoming more sustainable, cutting down plastic, et cetera, et cetera. And as Liz mentioned as well, the notion of involving local communities. But what really are the three important sustainability areas all destinations and businesses should address? Daryl, let's start with you again. Yeah, if I was going to pick three, um, it would probably be... Um uh, carbon decarbonisation as, as being the, the biggest issue we're facing. Um, I think from a customer's perspective, interestingly enough, one of the biggest issues is plastics. 
Um, and then the third one, which I think we've all got to grapple with, which probably isn't getting the attention that it uh, deserves, is biodiversity. Um, you know, biodiversity is one of those fundamental building blocks of planet Earth. And um, unfortunately, we're at a bit of a cliff point with biodiversity. And so we do need to uh, look more regenerative agriculture, preserving uh, wildlands and so forth. So, yeah, that'd be my three, uh, carbon, plastic and biodiversity. Okay, well, that's that's very clear what you've just stated. Um, Liz, what are your three big areas? I would echo some of what Daryl's saying. Um, first would be improvement of transportation options for visitors, so the decarbonization theme, to the destination as well as within, um, especially in urban areas. Um, maybe the second would be smarter use of natural resources like water conservation. Um, and then the third would be moving towards more sustainable energy generation in that destination. And I, you know, I, you know, I, you brought up biodiversity. I completely agree. That is the a foundational element that we need to address in order to um, improve our industry. Yeah, biodiversity is crucial. Um, Pansy, what are the three big areas that you're seeing? Well, for us as, um, you know, really the product developers and also uh, operators, I think it is important, of course, that um, we need to continue to um, help in educating uh, all of our uh, stakeholders, uh, both our staff members as well as the tourists themselves, uh, the importance, and also to demonstrate our efforts, basically, you know, that we have uh, persistently been championing uh, in, in, in improving uh, the standards and also uh, by leading, uh, leading by example. Uh, secondly, I think it is, uh, I agree, and I already had uh, flagged the, uh, earlier about the, the kind of, again, um, reorganizing how, in fact, the logistics, you know, of transportation, as well as even shuttling uh, tourists from one, one area to another, spreading out, you know, so that they, uh, they will not be basically feeling that um, it's not their duty, it's the duty of, you know, the, 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 the destination uh, host itself to basically have to answer to why there's over tourism or why there is, you know, not sufficient uh, kind of attention uh, to be placed into, uh, in fact, giving them uh, a, a more comfortable and enjoyment in traveling. And so we have to work on it as almost as if we are carving a sort of a partnership here so that, you know, both of both sides will need to be contributed uh, to toward you know a, a, a goal of maintaining uh, a, a more kind of sustainable uh, tourism development and I think lastly um, we have a lot to do and work there which is again the kind of uh, water uh, 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 preservation waste uh, problems and issues um, and also of course uh, the use of uh, you know uh, air uh, conditioning uh, these right. are all areas that we can, basically also, you know, work towards uh, right. through our investments and our development uh, 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 projects in the future that we can, you know, really put that, you know, really front and center for consideration. That's right. There's a lot to consider, isn't there? And there's so much more we can talk about, but sadly, we are running out of time. So I guess to close the session now, I've got to uh, one question for each of you, and if you can answer this in one minute or less, can all of you share one key takeaway from this discussion? Daryl, let's start with you. Yeah, I think the, the takeaway for me is that um, leadership starts at the top, as I think a few people have, have talked to today, but really after that it becomes a strategic planning exercise for the entire organisation. And so it really drops down into how you organize your business or your destination and, and what are the key criticals, whether, you, you know, you start with the sustainable development goals or, or whatever it is, and then really plan approach through. It, there's no silver bullets in this stuff. It's, it's a grind. It's got to, you've got to work it through. And, um, and that just takes time and effort and planning. Indeed it does. And you did that in just under a minute. Fantastic. Liz, what is your key takeaway in under a minute? Um, I would say my key takeaway is that, you know, the, the market and the industry is really moving. And I'm encouraged by the fact that it doesn't mean, you know, 
you can you have to start from purely nature based to to do sustainable development. You can start from a very developed operation like pansies and integrate. You know, so there are all different forms of progress that we can make to meet the needs of the new consumer and uh, our needs globally. Frankly, to to uh, create a a sustainable world and environment. Well said. And Pansy, what is your key takeaway in under a minute? Indeed. I think this has been a very, very enlightening and positive uh, dialogue because, in fact, it shows that um, from all different quadrants of the industry, uh, we are you know, really gearing up and we are very alert to at least the uh, issues at hand. And I believe that we are all working towards the same goal. Uh, we do not actually... None of us were talking about the problems of, you know, how can we achieve, actually achieve, you know, the same sort of uh, end goal. In fact, we are all quite uh, positive and, and basically having already a good footprint going forward. So I think in the end, um, the objective is how do we pull all the resources together? And Indeed. I think we, we already are beginning that process. All right, fantastic. You all did it in under a minute. So thank you for that. And I thank you all as well for joining us today to talk about these very important trends in this industry, how to drive sustainable investment and tackle the issue of climate change head on. Of course, we know despite the devastating impact of the pandemic on lives and livelihoods, especially in the tourism sector, it has provided a unique opportunity to reflect on the changes required to build back better toward a greener and more sustainable future. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed this session.